Good morning. Happy Sabbath. It is good to see everyone here. It is a different kind of Sabbath this morning for me. You could not have us. standing here, but nevertheless, here I am, and what this means to me, as I thought about it all week, is, Lord, I know why, at least what you told me, why you let my father go to sleep. It hurts. There is a gap in my soul that will always be there. But every time I think about him being asleep, every time I contemplate what happened, it reminds me, Marcus, it is time to stand up, walk up to the plate, and swing with your own back. And everybody needs to be reminded of that very fact. It is time for all of us to finish the work. We all have a work to do. And if we stand back in the shadows of someone else, then we will never do what God has asked us to do. Everybody must be on the front line. Brothers and sisters, the times in which we live are too solemn to be quiet, to stand back, to let somebody else fight, and we feed them information. We send them the current events. Talk about this. Have you seen this? No. It is time for all of us to step up to the plate with our own bat, nobody else's. That's something I had to learn. God said, it's your turn, Marcus. Moses, my servant, is dead. Walk in your own shoes, but finish the work. Brothers and sisters, it's been a high week And it's culminating into a high Sabbath. I feel God's presence here. We prayed for it, and he answered our prayer. I was talking to a a brother of mine last night who said he came into the meeting, and he said, man, the presence of God is here. I said, yes, he is. He said, I really felt that same presence when I pulled on to the campus. And I said, thank you, Lord. This is what we've been praying for. Brothers and sisters, it is time to ask God to peel back the scales from our eyes and let us see the urgency of the time and what is really taking place. You know, sometimes sin doesn't feel that bad. It doesn't seem that bad until Jesus says, I'm going to open his eyes for just a moment. I'm going to let him experience the devil and what he's trying to do. And when you do, you recoil from it. It makes you fearful and scared. At that moment, you're like, Lord, I don't want nothing to do with that. And that's where we need to be. It's 2018. This church came on the scene in 1844. Jesus has been in the most holy place since then. He's ready to come back. The signs are clear and they're everywhere. But God's people are asleep. Even those who love the truth for the most part are asleep. There is a lack of urgency in our behavior. 
But Jesus in his love is sending messages and sending servants and sending people to cross our paths to wake us up. Brothers and sisters, I'm assured of this one thing. The fact that I'm standing here tells me that it's time to advance. It is time to move forward and do it with a sense of urgency. No time to be caught up into all the different doctrines that are floating around. We need to be rooted and grounded in the present truth for today and to follow God in the most holy place and stop reaching for fruit that God is not serving. so that we can be prepared to see Jesus in peace. It is time to be a witness wherever we are. It's time to have the Spirit of God in us to the point where people who are not believers in the church can come around and realize that they need to talk to you about this gospel. You need to be able to go back to your local church and walk in in a presence comes in with you that causes the usher and the deacon and the person sitting in the seat to look at you and go, Lord, let me talk to that person. There's something different about that person. Where have they been? And you should be able to say, I've been in the upper room. I've been with Christ and I understand the mission. It was then when the disciples understood the mission of what God, what Jesus had been telling them, that they came on one accord and they moved like a company of soldiers in unity and they did the work that was given to them to do. Let us pray. Father in heaven, Lord, I thank you, I thank you, I thank you for bringing us all here today. Lord, I've prayed and I've agonized and I've pleaded and you have answered those prayers already, I know. Lord, I present myself before you, Lord. I'm just a human vessel. Speak through me. And then, Lord, I pray for your people that are assembled here. Lord, that your presence that is already here, that our hearts will be pliable, that you can mold and talk and speak to us. May anything that may be in our hearts and minds that are not like you, Lord, may it go away so that you can sit flat-footed in our hearts and minds right now, have full control of this place. May we receive the blessings of the Sabbath, Lord, and the communion of your presence. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In God's word, we, we read the story of the Israelites. They've been in captivity for 430 years. They've lost much of what they knew about God. They've taken on the things of the Egyptians, yet they were ready to leave when necessary, but they weren't ready. God called Moses. Moses tried to deliver them by taking the life of an Egyptian. He had to leave. But then God took his servant and got him ready, met him at the burning bush, told him what he needed to do. Moses accepted the, the, uh, the, 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 the instructions and went back to Egypt. Went back to Egypt, walks into Pharaoh's court and starts telling him, let my people go. Pharaoh starts mouthing off, who is this God that I must be mindful of him? 
I will not let thy people go. God begins to work. He begins to attack the gods of the Egyptians. He's trying to get Pharaoh's attention. Pharaoh resists the power of God. Until God says, I have one more thing to do, and you will let my people go. Can you imagine the preparation necessary to leave Egypt? Can you imagine after 430 years of slavery, it is time to become free? The message goes around. It's time to go. Here's what we got to do. It's time to prepare for the Passover. Get your houses in order. Get your lamb and seethe it. Get your family together and put the blood on the doorpost. Can you imagine? In Exodus 12, if you have your Bibles, I hope you do. Exodus 12. It is time to leave Egypt. Exodus chapter 12, verse 37. When you have it, let me hear it by saying amen. amen. And the children of Israel journeyed from Ramses to Succoth, about 600,000 on foot that were men, beside children. So it's easy to see there was roughly a million people leaving Egypt. And a mixed multitude went up also with them, and flocks and herds, even very much cattle. And they baked unleavened cakes of the dough which they brought forth out of Egypt. For it was not leavened because they were thrust out of Egypt and could not tarry. Neither had they prepared for themselves any victual. Now the sojourning of the children of Israel who dwelt in Egypt was 430 years. And it came to pass at the end of 430 years, even the self-same day it came to pass, that all the host of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. It is a night to be much observed unto the Lord for bringing them out from the land of Egypt. That is, this is that night of the Lord to be observed for all the children of Israel in their generations. Can you imagine, finally, after watching plague after plague given and taken away, almost able to leave and could not leave, and finally, after the firstborn of the Egyptians have been slaughtered, it is time to go. To the point the Egyptians were begging them to leave. Get out. But they are getting ready to go from being a slave to freedom. They leave and they head to the Red Sea. They get to the Red Sea. We know the story. Finally, Moses has to act. He has to put his rod in the, in the, in the Red Sea, and it opens up. God clears out an obstacle. They walk through the Red Sea on dry land. They get to the other side. They get to Mount Sinai. God begins to prepare them to make it into the Canaan land. The first thing he gives them is what? His law. He begins to show them who he is. In his law is his signature, his name, who he is, how to live, his character. So he gives that to them first because he's preparing them to go to Canaan. We know the story. They wandered in the wilderness. They apostatized. Only two out of the original, two out of a million or so, made it in. Brothers and sisters, here we are. Since 1844, God has brought this church into existence for the express purpose of warning the world of what is coming to spread this gospel to the entire world, 
and to reveal the man of sin. That's our duty. That's why we're here. That's why we were brought on the scene. And Satan has been busy trying his best with a degree of success in causing us to try to win the world without revealing the man of sin. But how can we win the world using the world's tactics, refusing to tell the world the truth? Just like the Israelites, they were on a journey. And coming out of Egypt, walking through the Red Sea, walking through a miracle of a sea that opens up, and you walk across on dry land, it stays open long enough for a million plus people to walk all the way across the sea. And then you turn around and you watch the Lord close the Red Sea and swallow up an entire army. Here we are in 2018. Lots of things have gone on. We are now at 22 million people in the church. The war is raging. Satan is busy. But guess what? God is also busy preparing our people to stand true to God, who will raise up the standard, who will not be fearful, who will stand with the torch and tell the truth, come what may. And since we've been here this week, we've been talking about this thing. We've been talking about being a slave, if you've been listening to Pastor Davis. We've been listening to Pastor Gates talk about the different things going on in the world. We see that the war is raging. We see that God is busy, but we see that Satan is busy. We've read all week about he still flatters himself that he can obtain the victory. Well, brothers and sisters, God's got a plan. He's about to do something mighty. What we have to do is be prepared to be called on his special team to give the loud cry. Brothers and sisters, I don't want to miss that. I don't want to miss that. Satan thinks he's going to win. I'm here to tell him I have no love for him. He is going to make, he's going to go down. My, I, I watched my brother who for 17 years sat in prison for a crime he committed not knowing if his sins had been forgiven. And when he found out that his sins were forgiven on the week of his execution, a complete peace came over him where he was not scared of death. I saw God work miracles right in front of me. I saw him open the Red Sea. I saw that in my brother. I saw him go from being fearful to complete peace, ready to go to sleep. Not that he wanted to, but ready. Brothers and sisters, here we are. We've got to have no fear. We have got to walk this chalk, we have got to walk through this journey and put our sins or have our sins put on the curtain. What did we read last night? Those who understand what's going on want to make sure that they complete the task for if God calls their name early, they don't want to have any work left undone. We got a work to do, brothers and sisters. In the beginning, as the world's spinning, it spins at a thousand miles an hour. On this planet, there's seven and a half billion people. Oh, let's go back. There's five and a half. There's five and a half billion non-Christians on the planet. Most of the planet are not Christians. And we have to warn the world.
There's 1.2 billion Catholics. There's 900 million Protestants. And according to the news last year, October, the protest was officially over. So now, 900 million Protestants are no longer protesting. They're not protesting the 1.2 billion Catholics in the system that they are in. There's five and a half billion non-Christians. And there's 20 plus million Seventh-day Adventists. And most of those have no idea of the mission, the message, or the duty for the time. But God still says, I have a plan. He still says, I'm going to win. You just got to get ready. 20 million seven day events. We are reminded, based on what we looked at, he still thinks he will obtain the victory. Now, I want to just do a little math before we go forward. We have seven and a half billion people. 2.1 billion Christians, 1.2 billion Catholics, 900 million Protestants, 20 million Seventh-day Adventists, and we have to warn the world. Now, I want you to think of this. Now, get this. If we reach 100,000 different people a day with the message and we're able to convert them in a day, 100,000 thousand people a day. That will be 36 billion, 36 million 500,000 new converts a year. In 50 years, we would only have converted a billion 835 million. Now how many how many people on the planet? 7.5. And really, you've got to reach everybody above you. In 50 years, that's all we've done. And in 50 years, <clears throat> there will be 10.5 billion people on the earth. So do you see the magnitude of what we have to do? Do you understand what has to happen? Do you understand that what we need is the unfettered presence of God's help to finish the work. Because even at 20 million, if every single person were working and knocking on doors and going forward, we still couldn't do it in our present condition. We need something more. We are reminded. He's now, two things has got to happen before Jesus comes. We've been talking about it all week. Matthew 24, 14, what does that say? This gospel shall be preached unto the whole world for a witness, and then shall the end come. 2 Thessalonians, ah, I'm trying to remember. 2 Thessalonians, where it talks about the man of sin must be revealed. It was, it was after Paul realized that they had given the gospel to the whole world. Jesus was not getting ready, getting ready to come back. He had gone and studied Daniel 7. And he realized we were missing something. Because can you imagine after all the disciples went through, they saw Jesus crucified. They saw him resurrected. They supped with him for 40 days. And then he went back to heaven. They were ready at that moment to do what was necessary for him to turn around and come right back. So they got busy. Taking the gospel to the rest of the world. Not wasting any time. Saul becomes Paul. He gets busy. Major things are happening. Then he said, let no man deceive you. 
because he realized one other thing had to happen. In other words, we won't even be alive when it happens. The, the most we can do is live the life of Christ, die with our sins on the curtain, waiting on those who will be living in 2018 to get it right, to vindicate the character of Christ. When you study the law, when you study God's word, you begin to get a clear understanding of God's character. Can you imagine a person that does not commit sin, that can walk the face of the planet and resist the tempter at every turn? That's what we're being asked to do, but we're not being asked to do it by ourselves. Brothers and sisters, we can overcome the evil one right now. The biggest obstacle to overcoming sin is our own self. We don't want to let self go. 